Good morning. This is a good looking crowd. I'm kind of nervous because I think this is really going to move us today. If you're new to us, and we always have first time visitors every single week, and I'm glad you're here. I hope you feel welcome. And I just want to say as your pastor that, man, I'm so proud of this church. Just the generosity that comes out of here. I know I don't want to rehash everything that, that Sally said, but listen, you're getting a reputation, literally, of being a giving and a serving church. And that's the best kind of compliment you get from the community, okay? We are recognized for your generosity and selfless serving. Man, it is awesome, and I'm so proud. I started around like a peacock because we have awesome people. I mean, it attracts people to the gospel when you do that, right? And the opposite is true. And that's why you see uh, sometimes an ineffective uh, attempts sometimes with churches. And man, I think you are a model in every way. And man, God, I'm telling you, I can't wait to reveal to you some of the opportunities that God's putting on our lap. Uh, but, but I knew that we would first have to make sure we've got a culture of generosity and serving, right? And we do. So we're almost at that three-year mark. Okay, most church plants shut their doors after the first year, definitely by the second. And so when you're this far along, that's a great sign. And it gives me the confidence that, that when God gives us the vision to move forward and to grow and all that stuff, I mean, you've already demonstrated that. So I didn't want to talk, distract too much from our message today, but I just want to give you that compliment on that. And man, if you haven't started serving and, and maybe you're just one step away from starting to give, I want to encourage you to do that, man, because I'm just hearing story after story from people that are taking those steps. So, if you're here, uh, we are in a sermon series called Momentum. It's called Momentum. And kind of the premise, kind of the, the gist of what's going on here, uh, that's kind of how we roll around. We try to do sermon series so that we can, as a, with a theme, we can move along as a church. And right now, we know, we, we need momentum. And it's one of the things that, 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 that flees us as Christ followers. Sometimes we lose that that fervor for following Jesus, okay? Sometimes we become numb. Sometimes we uh, kind of lose our passion, okay? And sometimes that's fault of our own. Sometimes we don't see that God is trying to connect us with people, and we resist that opportunity to do that. Or maybe we, he, he gives us the opportunity to give and to serve, and maybe we sabotage ourselves sometimes. But sometimes in life, things just happen. Life happens. We've discovered that here, and it, it, it just takes something out. It's like somebody let the air out of our spiritual tires, right? And we're just stuck and we can't go anywhere and we're kind of at the mercy of our situation. And so I know we're moving forward at a fast pace as a church and, and we, we knew we'd have to cover this. It's called Momentum. And we have on our YouTube channel, you can go back and see just about every sermon we've ever done. Okay, so you can catch up if you aren't, if you haven't caught up with us yet. But I'm so glad you're here and I really feel like God's got something for you today. And, and so I just wanted to kind of set you up and get us started. And here's kind of where we're going today. This is what it's going to look like. Sometimes you've got to fight, okay? Sometimes when you lack momentum and sometimes we have this tendency to just kind of sit around and let things happen, let our circumstances control us, right? We respond to our environment and what's going on. It kind of pushes us around. But one way to get momentum and to keep it, one way to protect it or regain it, is sometimes you've got to fight. Now some of y'all are saying, you know, Rich, that sounds pretty violent, man. I don't know, man. I'm a lover, not a fighter. And I love people like you, but listen, sometimes, spiritually speaking, at least, sometimes you've got to fight. And so I kind of pulled from my past and, and, and tried to make sure I was, I was getting this, is that sometimes you've got to fight. I'm like that too. I don't like to see fights. I really don't. MMA is pretty cool sometimes because they're trained for that and it's, you know, controlled. But I don't like fights. I don't like seeing that on YouTube. I don't, I mean, on uh, Facebook. I don't, I'm not that guy. Uh, but listen, I've got a story, probably like most of you do, especially the guys. We all have kind of this macho story. I've got one. I want to give it to you if that's okay. And to illustrate that sometimes you've got to fight. I went to elementary school right down here at Clay Street until the sixth grade. I had to go to Arlington, right? Arlington School. It's shut down now. But before York Chester was there, it was Clay Street. And I enjoyed school. I liked school. I was, I was fairly popular. I enjoyed my friends and my teachers, and it was fine. But some guy came along. Some guy who's kind of a new guy. He came that one year in my fifth grade. And he was a bully, man. He just bullied people. It usually wasn't me. He wasn't that much bigger than me, but he, he had this way about him, this presence about him that just made you, listen, change your course, change your routine, shut down. He would do that to people. 
He enjoyed doing that to people. And like I said, it usually wasn't me, but it became my turn, okay? Usually I just stayed out of the guy's way, but sometimes you'd get right in his sight. And that was it. And so I had gotten in his sights uh, there at Clay Street, and uh, man, he just started running his mouth. That's how it started, running your mouth. And what I literally had to do, the dynamics, and some of y'all are with me on this, when you run into something that bullies your life, man, it just, it just changes direction. I mean, you literally change where you sit, the path you go, all right, to go, to, to, to go outside and play. I would change all that. Okay, I lost joy. I, I started to develop dread, okay, because I knew this, this guy was going to be staring me in the face. Well, I just about had it, and I discovered something that we're going to talk about today is, is that sometimes you just got to fight. You've tried everything else, right? But sometimes you got to just push, put your fists up and fight. And so I remember sitting in PE one day, and I love PE, man, and this, I love sports, God. And he was threatening that too, so we're sitting in PE. And he started running his mouth again. And I had already decided, whatever the consequence, whatever might happen, because I was a good kid, I didn't get paddlings and all that stuff. I just couldn't go on like this anymore. It just wasn't going to happen. All right? And so one day I had already decided, I'd even practice, you know, when you start hitting your, when you're a kid, you start hitting your hand like this. And I thought about holding a rock in and I didn't know what to do, buying some brass knuckles or stealing them or whatever. And I was going to go and I was going to clock this guy. Because I just couldn't live like this anymore. Couldn't do it. And so he said that one last thing. I said, if he says one more thing, that's it. And he did. And that was it. And I turn around, and I'm so macho. I'm such a man. And when he did, I stuck him as hard as I could. I know that's not good parenting. Right? I know that. I'm not trying to get parent of the year. All right? I'm trying to teach us what to know when we know we have to fight. And I clocked him so hard with this haymaker, the biggest haymaker you have in the fifth grade. And I put all my guts and effort and sweat and tears into his eye. Bam! And not only did he leave me alone, well, first he's sitting there crying like a baby. And, I, and again, I stuck my chest, chest out. And, and, some, and some guy asked me, he said, you going to hit him back? He said, if my eye quits hurting, I am. But it, I guess it never quit hurting. Right? And I stuck him. Listen, I shut that thing down. I could go back. I could go back to my regular life because I enjoyed it. I wanted the joy in life. I didn't want to be uh, shackled by, by some bully in my life that just took away everything that, that I loved and liked to do, right? And not only that, but he was bullying other people. And my action by clocking him with that haymaker, that fifth grade haymaker, he started leaving other people alone. And check this out. This makes, it, this makes all that story sound, sound made up. But I, th I think I could bring some people in if y'all need me to, to vouch for it. But it wasn't two weeks later, he moved to Colorado. I think he just switched to another school because he was scared of me. But he, he moved, uh, that's what I heard, moved to Colorado. Okay, so I felt like my action not only benefited me by saying, man, this is enough. It, it, it affected other people too. They got some freedom in their life as well. Y'all follow what I'm saying? We could probably stop right there and really say, man, sometimes we just have to fight. So I want to get into Scripture with you, and I think you're going to like it. Uh, it's not that complex, and it's not that long. I, I've, if you're taking notes, uh, I've titled this message Holly because it's short and sweet. Where's Holly? There she is. Sorry about that. My blood sugar's up a little bit. I'm, I'm kind of sassy. Can y'all see that? So... Here's what we're going to do. I know that if you're like most people, man, it doesn't matter how much you fell in love with Jesus, how much he came into your life, your, your momentum that moving forward is going to get uh, attacked. Something, good things, bad things, uh, things you never expected, threaten you and to take the legs out from under your momentum, man. Because I, th I think if you're here, if you've mustered up enough within you, you want to hear from God, you want to connect with God. And even when you do on the deepest level, it comes along where our momentum is threatened. And we gotta, we've been talking about this for weeks. We're going to give you more today about how to protect that, how to get it. Because it's coming, all right? It's coming to threaten your momentum. So maybe you're complacent. Maybe you're apathetic. Maybe you've been burned. Maybe for whatever reason, that, I mean, you're just not 
feeling God, man. You're not, you're not putting forth. Maybe you've taken yourself out of the game. Wherever you're starting the day, we're going to give you some tools so maybe that won't happen again. And some of y'all are just on fire. Hey, man, I want you to stay on fire. And we've got to learn to protect that. And sometimes we've just got to fight. All right? So uh, we're going to look at one of the most famous fights in all of history and one of the fam- most famous ones in the Bible and uh, we're going to look at it. It's a, it's a real good story, real good underdog story. A lot of movies uh, are, are made after what we're talking about today. A lot of sports analogies are made. It's, a, you know, good and bad. Uh, we're talking about David and Goliath, okay? So some of you have been around church enough to kind of know that story. And listen, here's what I found. A lot of people outside of church that's never, never really read the Bible, man, they didn't even know about David and Goliath, Okay? But we're going to pull out a few things, and I'm really literally pulling out. I said, you know, I'm not going to make this difficult. I'm not going to try to add a whole lot to this or try to illustrate too much. I can just pull out some phrases from exactly what David did that I think is helpful to you and to me to protect that momentum or to get it back or to get it for the first time. So that's where we're going to be today. And I'm going to give you four statements I think is going to help you with that. So any way you can get this down, if you're, if you're a note taker, maybe you've got like this photographic memory, I guess, uh, but I wish you'd get this because not only does it affect you, it affects everybody around you, it affects your family and friends that you love, it affects your church on where your momentum is. Mine might be rolling, sometimes it's not. But maybe sometimes yours is and they're not mutually exclusive. When you're not, when you, when you don't have that momentum, it affects the people around you. It affects your family, your friends, and your church, okay? So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to kind of tell you what these are. I'm not going to be here long, so you won't be able to get much of a nap in, so just stay up, right? So here's the first statement, and I want you to catch this. If you're trying to prepare for a fight, here's the first statement. The first one goes like this. Have you seen the giant? When we read this passage in 1 Samuel, uh, if you read the whole thing we're not going to do today, because I really want to get to these points. I'm going to pull some of that out. But one of the first things that David asks is, have you, that somebody asked David is, have you seen this giant? Have you seen this giant? So if you're not familiar with this story, I just want to kind of catch you up. David is a boy. He's a shepherd, a shepherd boy. He's got a job to take care of sheep, okay? And this particular day, he's taking some lunch down, some peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, actually it was bread and cheese, taking it down to his brother on the battle lines. He's got older brothers. He's too small, but his older brothers are there and his dad sent some lunch. Take this to your brothers. See what's going on down there. So he runs it down to the battle lines and the, of, of the Israelite army, they're about to face the Philistines. Okay, their enemy. They're about to face their enemy. And when he gets down there, the first question they ask him, they said, what's going on? They said, have you seen this giant? You can go back and read it. Have you seen this giant? So, for David, for David, his giant was nine feet tall, nine, nine feet, nine inches tall, all right? Pushing 10 feet. Sorry. He's got 125 pounds full of armor, okay? This guy is snarling at the Israelite, at the Israelite army. I mean, he's talking junk, just like a, if you ever watch WWE, I don't, I really don't, but I see it on sometimes, and somebody's standing up there just flexing. They are just flexing and running off at the mouth. And that's what David's seeing this day, and here's what the Bible tells us about this, David, this Goliath, this giant named Goliath. It says, 1 Samuel 17, 16 says, for 40 days, every morning and every evening, the Philistine champion strutted in front of the Israelite army. Strutted in front of the Israelite army. Have you seen this giant? And here's what I know about today without even knowing you. Is you have a giant. We all have giants in our life. Something that threatens our, our livelihood. Something that threatens our very way of life. Something that really holds us down and tries to choke us out. So no matter who you are, where you came from, or why you came, somebody invited you, finally you came. They just bugged you too much. You said, okay, I'll go. All right? And even if you're just, some of you are just limping in here, and you have giants. And sometimes you got to fight. I want to read something I found to you that was so awesome this week. 
And the thing is, it's an anonymous writer. And if, if I wrote this, it'd be, my name would be all over it. It's so good. And I want to tell you what it said. It says, Goliath still roam our world. Debt, disaster, disease, depression. Supersized challenges. He struts in front of us. He liposuctions our joy. Isn't that awesome? Your Goliath doesn't carry a sword or a shield. He brandishes blades of unemployment, abandonment, sexual abuse, and depression. Your giant doesn't parade up and down the hills of a mountainside. He prances through your office, your bedroom, your classroom. He brings you bills you can't pay, grades you can't make. He brings people that you can't please. He brings whiskey that you can't resist. He brings pornography that you can't refuse. A career you can't escape, a past you can't shake, and a future you can't face. That's really good. That really puts it in perspective. That makes it real. So what God's trying to tell us today is, look, I'm not just telling you a story where somebody felt a little overwhelmed and I did my thing. I know that you face giants. I know that there are things in your life that are, that are overwhelming you. And sometimes you just got to fight. And that's what I want to talk about today. What is your giant? What is it that's standing in the way of your future? What God's called you to do uniquely. We've got things set up here that, that prepare you, life groups, and you're giving and you're serving. But that's just to prepare you for what God's got called you specifically to do. There's some things that we're called to do together. Don't resist that. Because in doing that, God's preparing you for something He's got specifically for you. I know maybe you've been in church situations where if it doesn't fit inside this box, then just don't do it. It's what happens here. I feel like, really, I feel like God's going to take so many people out of here in a good way. Not just because they're mad because of the, the color of the carpet, which we don't have that problem, right? But they're leaving because God's called them to something even greater. We want to be a part of that process. So don't resist what's going on here, but also don't resist that God's trying to put something in you that's amazing, that you can't even wrap your mind around. But listen, something threatens that. And so today we're learning how to fight. We're learning how to fight. Here's the second thing, the second statement you've got to get. Number one, have you seen the giant? Do you recognize what it is? Surely you do. You can see it. I don't care if you're a teenager old enough to be in here, which is about, what, 12 or 13 or 6th grade and up. They have giants, things that overwhelm them. Our students do. They don't know what to do or where to turn. Some people in here are, are, are elderly in a good way, okay? And they, they will tell you, I still fight battles. You don't outgrow your battles. You don't outgrow the bully in your life, okay? So the first one, have you seen the giant? What is a giant? Pick him out, know what it is, know who it is, know the circumstance that you're giant. That's number one. And here's the second thing. The second statement is this, I will fight. I will fight. Some of you, like I said earlier, just kind of slaves to your scenario. When, it, when your situation improves, then you might improve, right? When things start to get, you get a little bit more money at work, maybe then you'll start giving. Maybe then you'll start being obedient. All right? When your time is just attacked and there's a real temptation just to scale back what you're doing for the Lord, that's a real temptation. Is I'm going to wait till that, that settles out and then I'll do it. But sometimes you've got to fight. You've got to fight. You've got to take action. You've got to do things purposeful despite your scenario. And number one is, and then number two is this, I will fight. So if your answer to, have you seen the giant is yes, then your resounding response needs to be, well, I'll fight. I see the giant, pick me, I'm going to fight. I'm going to go with this thing head on. And that's exactly what David said in 1 Samuel 17, 32, it says this, don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul, Saul's the king. Don't worry about this Philistine. I will go fight him. Because I've got problems of a lot of people not wanting to fight this guy. This whole, uh, the Israelite army are paralyzed. They're on the battle line, all right. But nobody's fighting. Nobody's saying, I will fight. I'll go fight him. And we see this in David. He's tenacious. He's bold. He's audacious. He's ready to go fight. He says, I'm going to do it. I'm going to fight. And some of your marriage is falling apart. What are you going to do about it? You got a couple of choices. One is you can 
kind of continue to sit back and let it deteriorate, let it go. Or you can fight for your marriage. You can do something about it. Some of you had addiction. Man, you've been struggling with this for a long time. Maybe it's drug. Maybe it's pornography. Man, it's standing in the way. It's affecting your quality of life. It's affecting you being all you can be for the Lord to allow Him to work in your life. What are you going to do with that addiction? Are you just going to let it rule over you? Or are you going to do something? Or are you going to take some action to rule over it? All right? What are you going to do? Financial challenges. Some of y'all are just, you've got yourself in a jam. Maybe it was your fault. Maybe it wasn't. Either way, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to make a budget and try to stick to it even though you've done that before? Are you going to take some action? Are you going to sell some things? What are you going to do? What are you, what's your action? How are you going to fight against it? I wrote some more down. What about your weight? Some of you, man, your weight has just got you by the throat. It takes away from your self-confidence. Sometimes you miss out on opportunities because of your weight. It consumes your mind, but are you going to do something about it? Are you just going to be controlled by your, your giant? What about parenting? For some men, it's hard. It's hard. And so if you don't think that parenting is difficult, either you don't have kids or you really know kids and you're writing a book and I want to buy it, or you're smoking something that I want to smoke, because listen, parenting is hard. It's difficult. Man, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to make the wrong move. So maybe it's, maybe it's parenting. Maybe it's negativity. I wrote this down. Maybe negativity in your life is just threatening everything that you're doing. You need to step up and fight and say, look, I'm going to look for the good things and the holy things of God, and I'm going I'm to fight this negativity thing. It's really messing with me, and it's affecting how I live for the Lord. It's affecting my family. Okay, so what is your giant? When you say, I, I've picked it out, I know what it is, I want to fight, I will fight, I will do it. And this is really amazing to me when I think about out of everybody on the battle lines that day, everybody, David would have been the least likely to fight this giant. Okay? Everybody there is bigger. Everybody there is, has more gear. Everybody there has been trained. He's the least likely. But David's the only one that says, I'm going to stand up and fight. I walk in here and I see all these heavily trained guys and nobody's willing to fight. I'll fight. That's what he says. I'm going to fight. I'm going to fight. Now I want to show you something that I think is very, very important if you're saying, you know what? I'm facing something, Richard, in my life, and it's very overwhelming. What do I pull from? Where do I go? And, and maybe this whole story about David and Goliath. But here's what David did. I want to show you this. That David looked back to his past. To help him fight this fight coming up, he had to dig back and look at his past, and he just discovered in that moment that God, man, God's been really good to me. He has really provided for me when I need it. When I've needed him the most, I can reach back. And if you're a follower of Christ, you can look back at just how on top of things God is on your behalf for you. Okay? And so, and that's exactly what you're going to have to do if you're going to choose to fight. Okay? Because some of you haven't made a move in a long time. And it's not because I would never sing you out. I think you, some of you even told me. And it's because you haven't decided to fight. So when you do, one thing you're going to have to do is look back. And here's, a, here's just the application point for you. Your past has prepared you for the future. Your past has prepared you for the future. You've got to look at your past. How has God gone to bat for me? How has God helped me win battles in my life before? When has he helped me to overcome before? And I want to show you that this application point is from Scripture. So let me show you this in the Bible. In 1 Samuel 17, 33, Saul, the king, when he came up and says, hey, I'll fight. I'll do it. I'll do it. He saw the giant. He says, I'll fight. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy. And he's been a man of war since his youth. He's saying he's experienced. He's been through battle. He's won a lot. You're just a boy. 
But David persisted. I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. And when a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I would go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Saul consented, and he said, All right, go ahead, and may the Lord be with you. And we're Southerners, so we kind of understand this last part in Saul's response. He's really saying, Bless his heart. That's what he's really saying. All right, go ahead. May the Lord be with you. Bless his heart. Right? But what David's doing, I love his tenacity here. And I don't know if he's really saying this to convince Saul as much as he's trying to remember for himself. You know what? I've never faced Goliath, but I feel prepared in my experiences in my past. I've overcome some things. I've come out of some really bad relationships to know what to do and what not to do now. Okay? I've been out of money before. I've had things threaten my, my life before. And in our cases, we're trying to maintain our momentum, our spiritual life. And you know what, Dad Gummit? I'm, I'm more prepared. I'm prepared for this battle. I feel confident in what, not in myself, but what God's already done and shown me. He's already demonstrated that He's for me and not against me. So I can go up against this giant, and He's going down. He's going down. So that's exactly what you have to do is look to your past. What has God done in your past that he's trying to give to you and remind you of to face these giants? You can do this. You can do it because sometimes you've got to fight. Sometimes you've got to fight. Now, David may have been the least qualified out of all his people, but listen, he was the most available. That's what made him different. And I'm learning this, man. And I learn it. And I want to say it in the most loving way. One of the best things that you could do is to be available. That's available to your families, available to your church, available. And here's something, man, if you feel like tweeting, God's not looking for ability. He's looking for availability. That's what I found. He's not looking for the most qualified. Because if I thought that, we'd never be in West Gastonia, right here in this spot, right? We'd go where the ability might be. But here's what I read in Scripture. This is the kind of thing you find out when you read God's pattern is, look, Richard, the best thing you could do is move where nobody, where nobody thinks anybody has any ability. And I'm going to bless you, man. I'm going to bless that church. You're going to make a huge impact because I love it when people make themselves available. That's where the impact is. That's where the miracles are. God just wants us to, to be available to Him. So it's not your ability. It's your availability. Some of you need to pray that prayer. God, look, I can feel it. You're trying to transition me in life. And I don't know where you're going to take me. I don't necessarily, might not feel qualified for where you're taking me. But listen, I'm available and I read your scripture and I heard it today. That that's what you want. You want from me availability. And I got, I got to be honest with you, at this church, that's what we need from you too. It's your availability. Makes you awesome. Okay. I promise we're not looking for ability either. We're just trying to do what God says here. So God says, look, I'm, I don't expect you to be able. I expect you to be available. That's what I want because I can use that. I can use that. So here's the next one. I found it. If we put a little bit in God's hand, man, he turns it into a lot. So God, I'm not much. I don't feel like I've got, I'm really qualified. And I know it's what holds a lot of you back. That's what stifles your momentum is. I'm not, I don't feel very qualified. I'm not the best at anything. So maybe I'll just sit like I am right now. And God says, that's exactly what I want. That's what I want. That's what I'll use. Okay? So he says, I will fight. He, David made himself available. All right? And here's, here's the next thing. So if you're going to fight, you've got to get this statement down. It's the battle is the Lord's. That thing that you face, that thing that's overwhelming to you, that thing that keeps you up at night, stresses you out. You can't even enjoy your family because that thing's staring you in the face. You can't even enjoy a, a meal with, with friends because this thing's just, the shadow's just hanging over you. Listen, 
God said, that's my battle. I just need people available. I want people to be available. The Lord's battle. That's the Lord's battle. I wish we had time to look at the entire story. And you really need to go back and read this whole thing because God likes to speak to you. If we're going to move forward as a church, we need to make sure the people in the church are reading God's Word. So I told you where to read. In 1 Samuel 17, it's awesome. We're going to see some more awesome stuff in a minute. But God wants to show you and teach you something about your circumstances and how your life is going. And when he does that, he's trying to prepare you to move forward. He's trying to give you momentum. When you see people just hitting home runs for the Lord, they're slammed up. They got there because they protected their momentum. They were willing to fight when they saw that giant. Okay? If you're not familiar with the story, I want you to hear this. In 1 Samuel 17, 45, we'll skip down to 45 through 47. This is what it says. David re- replied to the Philistine, the junk-talking giant, all right? You come to me with sword, spear, and javelin. You're really prepared. But I come to you in the name of the Lord's heaven's armies, the God of the armies who, who, of Israel whom you have defied. Today, the Lord will conquer you. The Lord will conquer you. And I will kill you, listen, and cut off your head, and then I will give the dead, the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals. And the whole wide world will know that there is a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. Listen to this. This is the Lord's battle. And he will give you to us. I'm only pulling out things that are quotes so far of what David is saying. David said, have you seen the giant? He says, I see him. And David says, I'll go fight. And he recognized that this is the Lord's battle. That should take a lot of the pressure off of you. A lot of times we heap all the hustle on ourselves. Well, I got to get a second job. I got to get a fourth job. I'm going to have to trim the fat. It's going to have to be this and that. Your hustle. God says, I know what your giant is. If you make yourself available, that's my battle. Because you're my child. And I want this victory for you. And it's my battle. So what the, one of the things that we can walk out of here doing is, hey man, today when we respond in worship, God, I give you my giant. I give you this. This is your battle. And I recognize that. For some of you, that's all God's waiting on you is to, is to acknowledge, man, that's his battle. That's his battle. So, but if you don't read your Bible, man, you, you don't catch up on awesome stuff like that. Like, I'm going to cut your head off and I'm going to feed it to the animals. That's awesome. And it, you don't get stuff like that if you don't read your Bible. There's awesome stuff in here, right? That sounds pretty gruesome. But here's what I want you to recognize. Man, that this is, a, sorry, sorry, Brad. Sorry, bud. Worship pastor, I'm going to get a knuckle sandwich when this is over. I'm sorry. But here's the deal. This is a fight. And I'm not saying go and play patty cake with the giant. This ain't no pillow fight. It's not slap boxing. This is a fight. So if you're going to go at it, you, ha- you have to say, man, sometimes you've got to fight. And this is a fight. Man, this is an enemy. It's a fight against an enemy that's coming against you. It might hurt. But you got to fight. We got to fight. And I want you to see what he did. And when you read this whole account, when you go back today and read this, maybe you've read it a hundred times or maybe you've never read it once. You've never cracked open the Bible and that's awesome. Okay? You might have a head start on some people that's been around the Bible all their life but never read it. You probably got to jump on them. You know what I'm saying? But crack it open to this and watch this. And when you read this account, this is what you'll find. I counted. I just went through and circled all the accounts of what David focused on and this is what you'll see that he makes nine references to God nine God references nine times he talks about God and two times he talks about Goliath so if you're going into a fight you're going to face this thing maybe you've been in denial or maybe you've been ignoring it maybe it's 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 kicked your tail a few times you decide you know what I'm going to fight not a pillow fight I'm going to fight And when you do that, listen, what David did was, 
he acknowledged God twice as much as he did the enemy. Some of y'all, that, that might just went over your head, but some of you hit right in the heart because sometimes you acknowledge the enemy, you acknowledge the giants, those things in your life, way too much. You give it too much credit. You're too focused on the problem. You're too focused on the enemy. And the way David came up with it, he, 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 he acknowledged twice as much as he did the problem, but much as his enemy, okay? And so what this is saying, the battle is the Lord. And this, you can write this down. I think this is tweet worthy. And it'll pop up on the screen. It'll stay a second. Because listen, if you focus on the giant, you stumble. But if you focus on God, the giant will tumble. I forgot to tell you, I got a corny one today, and that's it. That's my corny, but it's true, isn't it? Corny's the new cool. I think so. I like corny, right? But that's so true. It's corny, but true. Corny, but true. If you focus on the giant, you'll stumble. But if you focus on God, the giant will tumble. It rhymes, so it must be right. right? You got that one? What I'm saying is, man, look at your problem from a different view. Look at it. It looks bad. It looks overwhelming. It seems that way. But God overwhelms. If you, do, if you go in to fight this thing, He overwhelms all situations. If you'll let Him. God wants, wants to put things into you. He wants to, sur- again, I keep beating this down. He wants to surround you with people as you face your giant. He wants to put things into you as you read His Word, as you go to life group. And you get over, you change your mind that it's not just telling all your personal stuff to a bunch of people I don't know, to God, man, I recognize you're trying to prepare me for battle. You're trying to do that, God. And when you give, man, you're such a generous church, and I, I really appreciate that. We're able to do so much of a church our age. That's why we move fast. One of the things is your obedience in that. But listen, God's doing way more in you than he's doing for us in your giving. Maybe he's trying to uh, work on your addiction to your dependency on material things. Who knows? But God's trying to put something in you and he knows you're facing giants and he says, listen, the battle is mine. The battle is the Lord. David tells us that. Okay? The battle is the Lord. And he said, you know, he knew what to do. I'm not going to focus. I'm going to put all my focus and attention on God and not on my giant. I'm going to fight. So some of you know the rest of the story, but I'm going to say it because, listen, when I used to sit in church and it, it, I was in my very late teens and even early 20s, I'd go into church and I felt like everybody knew the Bible but me. I found out later that's not, that's not true at all. But I thought I'll never stand on stage and act like assume everybody out here knows Scripture. So if you get impatient with me because I act like nobody's read it, I'm not even talking to you. I'm talking about the people who come in who are far from God, feel far from God, so that they will know and understand Scripture. So please be patient with that. If you want to get deep, let's meet up. Let's come to life group. Come to my life group, and we'll get deep. But we're going to make it where people can understand this so they can see how the Bible applies to their life, right? Because we've made this thing revolve around lost people being rescued by God. So I'm not going to make it hard on them by acting like everybody's already read it. Is that okay? Is that okay? Thank you. Thank you. Good. I'm glad you got that. And here's what happens in the story. At this point, he runs, David runs to the battle lines with a sling uh, and a stone, and he hits the giant right between the eyes, and the giant falls. And of course, David didn't have his own sword because he said, you know, the Lord's prepared me for this. He takes out the enemy's sword, chops his head off. Okay? That's what David does in this moment. And all the Philistines run off like a bunch of wimpy babies. Right? Run off crying. And, and the Israelite win that battle because David decided, okay, everybody got the victory because David decided to stand up and say, I'll fight. And man, I can't help but compare that to my family. Listen, the people around my family, my church, my my church family, they need me to stand up and fight. I, f- I free them up when I'm willing to say, I'll go fight. And I recognize this is the Lord's battle. He's going to prepare me for that. And some of you are at that very point. You just need to say, man, 
realize, maybe that's a leverage point that says, man, I'm, I'm the father of my family, but I'm not the spiritual leader. I'm really wimping out in that area. But when you hear the fact that, man, when I decide to fight, and I just decide to make some moves, no matter how comfortable it is or scary, it starts to affect other people. And his, his army's freed up here. And maybe that's just what some of you need to do. God will tell you, man, if you ask him. And that's why you could be confident. That's why he's so confident. He knew what God had done. He knew he was prepared because God, he was confident in God. And that's why the scripture says this. It says, if God is for us, who could ever be against us? If God's on our side, what could ever beat us? So I had to ask the question myself, you know, what's the giant pacing up and down in my life? Morning and evening. What's the giant in your life that when you get up in the morning, when you go to bed, it's the first thought and the last thought. What is it that consumes your mind, that giant that just keeps resurfacing, talking junk into your life, whittling you down to just kind of existing, living a mediocre life? What is that? The battle is the Lord. So you've got to see the giant, recognize what it is. You've got to say, man, I'm fight. I'm ready to go. I'm going to do this. I'm tired of being bullied. I'm tired of this. I'm going to go fight. And remember that the battle is the Lord. Now, here's one more statement. If, if you're going to go out of here today and try to say, man, I'm, I'm ready. I'm putting on my, glo- my boxing gloves. I'm ready to fight this thing. There's one more statement. It's not a direct quote from Scripture, scripture but it's implied. Okay? be my direct quote, but I'll show you how that works. Here's the last thing is, I have everything I need to win the war. When you go into it, you're facing that thing. That circumstance in your life that's really overwhelmed you, whether it's a diagnosis or a, a bill in the mail, whether it's a person at work, something that just seems so overwhelming, that, that thing that you can't even talk to people about because they wouldn't understand. You've got to know going into the fight that not only is it, is it the Lord's battle, listen, I'm willing to fight and God's already given me exactly what I need. He's already given to me. I have it. I haven't. A lot of people wait. When I get more money, when I get a better job, when I get more time, you know, that right person comes into my life. We wait on those things. And it robs us of our momentum of moving forward spiritually. Because time flies, doesn't it? And this is a distraction to what God wants to do. Now listen, I want you to pay attention. I was going to give you some Bible trivia. Some of you will go way back to 1983, VBS or Sunday school to get this. But how many shots did it take for David to kill Goliath. How many shots? Right? One. You got it. Right? But how many stones, and I'm not saying y'all be that lucky to hit him, kill your giant in one shot, right? But how many stones did he pick up? Scripture tells. Some of y'all might know this from kind of previous church experience. He got five. He got five stones to put in his little shepherd bag, right? So, I want you to hear this. 1 Samuel 17, 40 says he picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them in his shepherd's bag. Then, armed with only with one shepherd's staff and a sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. He picked up five, but he only used one. And, you know, I started thinking, why? Why did he only, why did he get five? Why did he get five? What, what was that about? And there's a couple different theories and, you know, that a lot of scholars think, and I read about them, and I'll give you a couple just so, because I think they're a little bit of truth and relevance to our life with all of them. They're not, they're not competing uh, for relevance, okay? But one is this, is just, maybe the giant's just so big, sometimes you just have multiple stones. And maybe in David's case, you know, some of y'all are really fighting something like that. You've tried it before. You've tried to fight your giant before, and some giants are just so big, they need more than one stone. It's probably the case. I started thinking about some of you all, and I was trying to jot it down. Some of you are like, man, I've already gone to marriage counseling. I've already did that one time. Sometimes it doesn't work in one shot. I've already gone to marriage. Well, go again. Try it again. God's going to give you another shot. All right? I've already tried to quit my addiction. I've tried it a few times. We'll try it again. Try it again. 
God's giving you more than one song. He's giving you another opportunity to fight this thing. When you look at circumstances in your life, man, he, 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 some of you try to get on a budget. You need to get on a budget. Well, I've already tried that, but we'll try it again. Try to start saving some money. Try to start paying down some of the debt that you've got. All right? So maybe the giants will be you need more than one stone. And I want to encourage you, if you're fighting it, maybe you're discouraged because you've lost a battle before with the giant or he just didn't go down. And here he's back up again. God's giving you another shot. He's trying to encourage you with that giant. He, he does not want you to walk around in defeat. He does not want you to do it. Now you know Man, kind of David's plan, God's plan, really, to, to, to fight in your giant. Now, I read this, so it was kind of confusing, but I finally got to it. He only got five, but he used one. And I started reading Scripture, and in 1 Samuel 21, it finally finds out that, listen, when you kill somebody like that, and back in David's day, listen, their relatives are going to come after you. They want blood and revenge. So when you kill somebody, they're coming after you. I thought it was pretty neat when I read in 1 Samuel 21. Guess how many, he used one stone Goliath. Guess how many relatives he had that he would, David and his armies would have to face again. Four relatives. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? And what that tells us is maybe you're going to have to fight this now. Maybe it's going to pop back up again. But you've got to be willing to fight. You've got to be willing. Would you stand up with me? i got something, one more thing for you. Building off of everything you need you already have so if listen if you are a Christ follower you've given your life to Christ before this will pop up on your screen you already have everything that you need to stand against against the giants in your life if you know Jesus Christ then you are, have already won the victory you've already been prepared God's given you everything you need